uh, Professor Ramoshi from Queen's, uh, Queen's University, and he will be speaking on the arithmetic of function trees. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to the organizing committee, Biplob, Jyotsna, Rashi, and, and others. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation to uh, speak at uh, this conference honoring uh, Professor B. Ramakrishnan. <clears throat> so it is, a, it is a pleasure to dedicate this uh, lecture to Professor Ramakrishnan. Uh, this is a conference photo from 60th birthday conference of Manikam that was held in uh, Kerala. And you can see that um, uh, there are many students of um, Ramki there, Kalyan Chakra, uh, Jabban Mayor, Brindavan Sahu, and um, um, I think. I think I did. I miss. Uh, sorry, I missed Karan Dev, and and uh, and I hope I haven't missed um, others. Uh, if I if I have, I apologize. Uh, but uh, already you see uh, the lasting impact that um, um, uh, Ramki has made in um, in uh, the you know mathematical development of India. According to the Taiti Upanishad, life is meant for two activities to study and to teach. Swajaya Pravachana Abhyamna Pramadi Kavyam. Do not refer. So, uh, as I was mentioning, I can see, I can see um, six of Ramki learned the year 10, but uh, so you have Santal Kumar, Jabun Meher, Brundavan, Sahu, Karandev, Shauli, and Kalyan, as far as I can tell. Maybe there are more, um, and uh, I have collaborated with a good chunk of these people, uh, so I think he has left. Uh, so it's a pleasure to dedicate this lecture to him, uh, Ramki, as we all call him. His life in mathematics certainly fulfills the wisdom of the Upanishads. So let me begin with uh, a discussion on the that obelisk or Rosetta Stone that was on the front um, of my talk. Chiseled in 196 BCE, the Rosetta Stone is a proclamation in three different languages. Uh, hieroglyphics, demotic, and Greek. So the top you see hieroglyphics, in the middle you see demotic, and the bottom you see Greek. It was discovered in 1799 by the Napoleonic contingent when they invaded Egypt. So I guess invasions of countries have some good. Uh, as no one knew how to decipher hieroglyphics or demotic, the presence of the Greek language enabled archaeologists to decode the script. So having knowledge of one script, namely Greek in this case, enabled the decipherment of the other two languages, the hieroglyphics. This is why now how we know um, uh, what the hieroglyphics at least symbolize. So why did I mention um, the Rosetta Stone? Well, the analogy of the Rosetta Stone was invoked by Andre Vey in um, uh, discussing certain themes in, in number theory. Uh, in 1921, Emil Artin discovered an analogy between function fields over finite fields, these are called global function fields, and algebraic number fields. And he developed a theory of quadratic function fields and was the first to conjecture that if you have an elliptic curve modulo p with p prime, then the number of points n sub p is p plus o of square root p. Now this conjecture of his was proved in 1933 by Hassa, and in 1939, Ray noticed a further analogy between the theory of Riemann surfaces and global function fields. So um, in 19, by 1941, he had a proof of the analog of the Riemann hypothesis for zeta functions of curves over finite fields. And uh, it is this threefold analogy that led him to formulate his famous conjectures in 1949 that were later proved by Dwork, Groth, and Deacon, finally Delin. So there was an analogy between number fields, algebraic number fields, and Dedekind zeta functions and Art and L series on one hand. Then there was an, then there was an analogy to the function fields with the zeta functions of function fields over finite fields. And then there was an analogy to uh, Riemann surfaces and the theory of curves. So this, these threefold worlds seem to be interconnected and uh, the Vey conjectures are a testimony uh, that this uh, interconnection is not just uh, superficial, but extremely profound and deep. 
so the analogy is between prime numbers and irreducible polynomials. Uh, so you take a finite field of Q elements, FQ, and look at the polynomial ring. And uh, the analogy is that uh, irreducible polynomials in this ring A uh, and prime numbers in ordinary integers are analogous. And we can search for uh, analogs of classical theorems in the function field case. So once you have set up this analogy or the metaphor of the analogy, you can now begin uh, a, prog a program of research and you can see what theorem in the number field world uh, corresponds to what theorem in the function field world, and or you can go in the other direction. And so this is basically um, the theme uh, that uh, Arden had initiated. An explicit formula for the number of irreducible polynomials of degree n is quite easy to deduce, and we teach this often in algebra classes. The formula is given by this um, Mobius function, one over n summation d divides n mu d, q to the n over d. So that's a very easy thing. And from this, it's easy to see that the number of irreducible polynomials of degree n is q to the n over n, and the error term is q to the n over 2 over n. So this is the analog of the prime number theorem with an error term uh, as good as uh, Rh in the classical case. So with this very elementary uh, observation, you see you have the kind of Riemann hypothesis in this, in this uh, trivial case. Um, so now that we have set up the analogy, you can ask, well, are there um, function field analogs of classical theorems of um, prime numbers? So uh, just like the prime number theorem has this analog, we can ask, is there an analog of Dirichlet's theorem of the infinite to the primes and arithmetic progressions? So, uh, and indeed, it, this is a theorem, a famous theorem of uh, Kornblum, 1919, a student of Edmund Landau. Uh, he proved it in his doctoral thesis. And uh, after Kornblum died in World War I, um, Landau had the unpleasant task of writing up his thesis in the form of a paper which appeared in Matt Seif's script. So um, this is the problem with um, global conflicts. We lose intelligent people. So the theorem is as expected. So A of X and M of X are two co-prime polynomials, and the theorem is that there are infinitely many irreducible polynomials congruent to A of X modulo M of X. Uh, so we call that capital A's FQ of X, and if we want to do a counting of this number of irreducible polynomials in a given arithmetic progression with degree capital N, then you can write down using, again, an analogs of the theory of L-series, uh, the main term is Q to the N over N with 1 over 5M, and this 5M is the analog of what you expect it to be. It's the number of co-prime residue classes modulo M, the analog of the Euler function. So you have all this beautiful stuff emerging. And as you can see, um, you know, the classical theorem of Dirichlet in primes and arithmetic progressions goes back to something like uh, 1860. And, uh, and then we have Kornblum's theorem appearing in 1919. Now, the dth power residue symbol was introduced in um, Arten, uh, Arten's doctoral thesis in 1921. Uh, Carlitz observed that the general reciprocity law for global function fields can be derived easily using basic Galois theory. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> when you want to define the dth residue symbol, the d has to divide, divide um, q minus 1. And <clears throat> Uh, we know that x to the a is a dth power is solvable if and only if uh, a to the uh, norm p minus one over two um, <clears throat> is congruent to one mod p. So this is a very elementary exercise uh, that applies generally to cyclic groups uh, called the Euler criterion, uh, which you probably know in elementary number theory. And the left-hand side of this congruence is in any case an element of order D. And uh, since the mapping F goes to A mod PA is one to one, there is a unique alpha such that uh, A to the P minus one over D is congruent to alpha and that's the dth power residue symbol. So now that I've defined the dth power residue symbol, uh, we'd like to know if there's a reciprocity law and the answer is yes. Suppose P and Q are irreducible, uh, irreducible polynomials of degree delta and nu then the, the Q over P, the dth power residue symbol is, e is equal to P over Q modulo this plus or minus sign, which is given by this um, factor. And here's the remarkably simple proof due to Carlitz. 
uh, let's define A over P to be the Q minus one power residue symbol. And then any D power residue symbol will just be a power of the Q minus one power residue symbol. And so it suffices to prove it in the special case the, of the Q minus one power reciprocity law. And uh, if, uh, if you have a root of the polynomial P, remember P and Q are irreducible monic polynomials and the Galois automorphism, uh, the Galois automorphism is just X goes to X to the Q. That's, that's it. And they're all cyclic extensions. Therefore, if you have one root alpha, you have all the roots. They're given by alpha to the Q, alpha to the Q squared, dot, dot, dot. So you can write down the polynomials in this neat, very clean fashion. And once you do that, uh, you, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but once you do that, you apply the Euler criterion and ask yourself, what is this Q of T um, mod T minus alpha equal to? And you write this down in terms of Q to the delta minus one over Q minus one, and then that is a sum and then realize that this can be rewritten in this neat form. And then once you've done that, then you can write down the, um, because this has to correspond to the Q power residue symbol. When you evaluate it, it turns out to be this, this double product. And now you see a symmetry. Uh, this, once you have the symmetry, immediately you see Q over P and P over Q are equal modulo or sign, you take care of what the sign is and bingo, you get uh, this remarkable these power res reciprocity law. In the function field case, it's actually simple Galois theory and nothing more. In the number field case, it's more complicated than that. And most of you know it, uh, you have to get into this theory of the Stickelberg element and things like that. So it's a little bit more complicated in the number field case, but in the function field case, it's very beautiful and very simple. An application of this is if you have a square free polynomial of degree capital K, uh, you may want to count how many irreducible polynomials are there such that A of X is an Lth power mod P of X. And uh, I just want to present a, a neat application of this. Uh, the number of such uh, polynomials is, um, I should have said something else. I should have said uh, P of X has degree N, sorry. Uh, P of X is degree N. Uh, so how many such polynomials are there? N sub L is bounded by Q to the N divided by L to the K, where K is the number of fact, um, uh, the degree of A of X. And the reason for this uh, bound <coughs> is if you factor A of X into irreducible polynomials and apply the reciprocity, uh, you sh it shows that P of X must belong to certain progressions mod A of X. And um, if you, if you ch that means it must belong to these progressions. And then you just start counting how many polynomials are there in a given arithmetic progression. And the nice thing in the function field case as opposed to the number field case is you're essentially counting polynomials of a certain degree and you don't have to worry about greatest integer functions and things like that. So that kind of gets wiped out. And so once you understand that, you get this remarkable clean bound. Uh, Civ theory in the function field case is a little cleaner. An application of this uh, idea is to the Artin primitive root conjecture in global function fields. Uh, in, on September 12th, 1927, so people keep remembering September 11th, I, I want to remember September 12th. September 12th is important for <laughs> this Artin conjecture. Uh, Artin, in conversation with Hasse, formulated his famous primitive root conjecture. In this, he was motivated in showing the, a concrete application of his non abelian L series. And um, he formulated, and as everyone knows, most it's still an unsolved problem, although much progress um, has been made by many mathematicians. In 1933, looking for a thesis topic for his student, Bill Hartz, Hasse assigned Artin's conjecture as a problem for research. A year later, Paul Erdős announced that he had a proof of Artin's conjecture modulo the generalized Riemann hypothesis. This discombobulated Bill Hartz completely that Hasse had to find for him another research topic, even though Erdős's proof never appeared. Uh, so Bill Hartz worked on the function field analog of Artin's conjecture and solved it assuming the analog of the Riemann hypothesis for curves over finite fields. And he published his work in 1937. And in 1939, Davenport wrote a paper in which he noted that the full Riemann hypothesis is really not essential in the function field case and a quasi Riemann hypothesis suffices to solve Artin's conjecture in that case. Uh, and and uh, this is not very well known, um, uh, but um, anyway, the work of Davenport is, is uh, beautiful. 
it's quite elementary using only the theory of Gauss sums over finite fields. Uh, and the key theorem in his paper is that if f of x is a polynomial of degree k and chi is a non-trivial multiplicative character, then um, uh, summation chi of f of x is equal to all of q to the one minus um, one minus uh, what is that thing? One minus um, three over two k plus four. So whatever it is, uh, the power is strictly less than one, provided k is at least uh, four. Um, and this was sufficient to resolve Artin's conjecture uh, for a global function field and give an elementary proof without the use of any high powered algebraic geometry. Uh, in a recent paper, uh, my postdoc showing Kim and myself, we gave an even more elementary proof based on a classical idea of Hadamard and the lavalle Poussin and their proof of the prime number theorem. Most of you know that the prime number theorem, the classical prime number theorem, relies on the fact of the non-vanishing of the Riemann zeta function on the line real part s equals one. And then uh, Hadamard noticed that uh, you could do slightly better than that. You could actually get a, a, a tiny zero free region for the Riemann zeta function. That allows you to produce an error term. And our, um, my joint work with showing uh, shows that if you do the analogous calculation in the function field case, um, the, you do get a zero free region. And that's essentially enough to um, solve uh, Artin's conjecture in the function field case. So the, let's just give you a crash course in the theory of L functions over, over finite field. Uh, you have a multiple, uh, an R tuple of multiplicative characters, an R tuple of irreducible polynomials, and you can form these character sums, S of X. And then you define the resultant of two polynomials to be uh, F of uh, the resultant of two polynomials F and G to be product of F of theta, where theta runs over the zeros of G. And then with this definition in hand, you can now define a character on the um, polynomials. Uh, X of G uh, is a product of these characters and then develop a, an L function. And it turns out the properties of the resultant are enough to show multiplicativity of um, the function X of G. And uh, this L function not only has, is a Dirichlet series, but it also has an Euler product. So um, here's the basic setup. Uh, the Euler product um, is as you expect it to be. Um, and uh, but because you have the Euler product, uh, you can, um, analyze the Euler product. And uh, for example, in the simplest possible case, uh, when you look at A equals FQ of X and you try to write down the zeta function corresponding to that, it turns out to be a very simple function. And from this particular zeta function, by the way, you can rederive that formula for A sub N, the number of irreducible polynomials of degree N that I mentioned at the, at the outset. But now in this context, uh, it has zeros, but uh, poles at s equals one plus two pi i n over log q. So somewhat slightly different in sharp contrast to the classical case, um, because the, in the classical case, the Riemann zeta function only has a pole at s equals one and no other points on the, in the complex plane. Now the L function turns out to be a polynomial in q to the minus s. The reason for that is really the Euclidean algorithm, the division algorithm. And so you can write down um, uh, the L function in this fashion, where these things Q to the SIs are the roots. And so this is, this is to be thought of as the analog of the Hadamard product factorization. It's very simple in this case, you see. Uh, Hadamard product factorization in the uh, function field case is like this. And so if you understand your classical De La Valle Poussin argument of finding a zero free region, it's a play on the classic the three plus four cos theta plus cos two theta being non-negative and the Hadamard product. So uh, you end up getting this inequality and then, um, and then you get a zero for region of the following shape that the L function has no zeros to the right of one minus C over K minus one log Q where K is the sum of the degrees of all the FIs and Q of course is that. So C is an absolute constant. Uh, so you get this kind of zero free region. Now, if f of d is the order of q mod d, here's an application. Let a of x be a square free polynomial. Uh, the number of irreducible polynomials in fq of x of degree n for which a of x is a dth power is q to the n over n. That was, we saw that in the counting of the irreducible polynomials, but now you have to divide by d f of d. And then there's an error term. The error term is all of q to the n e to the minus n over f of d times k. So this is, this is the analog of the 
um, prime number theorem for this particular problem, the proportion of irreducible polynomials for which A of X is a dth power is given by this uh, probability uh, df, one over df of d. And this is the error term. So now we can, we can apply this knowledge to the art and primitive root conjecture. So let fix a parameter y, write q to the n minus one as a times b, where a is composed of primes l less than y and b is composed of primes bigger than or equal to y. I'm gonna choose y later. And you don't need to really worry about too many of these technical details, but f of d then can be bounded as uh, e to the cy. And by our theorem, the number, uh, each character sum that corresponds to a non-trivial character is O of Q to the N, E to the minus N over F of D uh, times K minus one. And then uh, choosing Y to be very small, you can control the error. And so the final crux of the matter is the number of irreducible polynomials for which A of X is not a dth power for all D dividing capital A is by the inclusion exclusion principle given by the sum. So this is a kind of an elementary sieve. So we, we do the simple asymptotic sieve. So I've calculated already the number of irreducible polynomials which, for which A of X is, an L, is not an Lth power for all divisors of A. Now I have to remember I factored Q to the N minus one as capital A times capital B. I have to worry about these large prime divisors and these large prime divisors, uh, I'm just going to subtract those uh, irreducible polynomials for which it is an Lth power. And I split that sum into two pieces. And we'll apply the Lth power reciprocity law to the last piece. Remember earlier, I gave you an estimate for n sub L. And now um, we, we choose the, uh, we ch we, with this choice of Z. And because of this rapid convergence with L bigger than Z, you get an estimate like this. And then um, finally, the middle sum, in the middle sum, you actually apply that previous lemma, lemma 0.1 that I wrote down, and you end up getting this as an estimate. And notice that this is Q to the N over N divided by L F of L, and L is bigger than Y, and it's less than Z. But the fact of the matter is that summation one over, so I'm gonna choose Z to be N to the one minus epsilon, um, summation um, one over D F of D actually converges by a famous theorem of Romanov, which is an elementary theorem, by the way. We don't wanna get into proof of all that stuff. Uh, and so you end up getting um, that um, finally that the um, an asymptotic formula, but now you have to analyze the main term. And in order to analyze the main term, there's a beautiful inequality of Heilbrunn um, that we, we use. And this is uh, says basically, if you have X1 to Xn real numbers with zero less than Xi less than one, and A1 to An are finite set of natural numbers, then this inclusion exclusion combination with the LCM of the AIs has a lower bound. And uh, we apply that in, in our context and lo and behold, uh, the lower, the uh, main term is big. That's, we just need to show that the main term was big. And so the, the two error terms were small, the main term is big and lo and behold, you get an elementary proof of the um, Barton conjecture over function fields uh, without using any um, non-trivial quasi Riemann hypothesis for the function, uh, zeta functions over function fields. And in the time remaining, I think I'm not sure how much time I have, but I think it's a 45 minute talk. Uh, so I thought I would uh, conclude uh, this uh, talk by talking about an analog of a theorem of Mirsky. Uh, in 1949, Mirsky showed that every sufficiently large natural number can be written as a sum of a prime and a k-free number. And uh, in 2001, um, Wei Chen Yao, um, looked at the function field version of this paper and wrote a paper which he almost proved the analog in the function field case. Uh, some errors in estimation were flagged by Muriel Carr's math review and the problem appeared in Moray's 2012 survey paper on Artin's conjecture. And that's how I ended up um, noticing the problem. And Shoin Kim and I studied Yao's paper and we noticed that the error in his paper can be fixed by a careful analytic method um, so how do you correct it? Uh, so now we, we have um, the following theorem. If um, capital M is a fixed polynomial and K is at least two, denote by P plus the set of all monocuridus polynomials with degree D, such that P plus M 
is a k-free polynomial. Then you have that the number of such polynomials has a certain degree. Um, uh, so, sorry, a number of such polynomials has a certain um, density, and this density is given by this, this product. Um, and then we can also derive not only um, an asymptotic formula, but an asymptotic formula with error term. And um, keep in mind, by the way, that the number of irreducible polynomials of degree D is Q to the D over D. So this, this quantity, Q to the D over D, is essentially the denominator. So you put that in, and then you get, you get an error term here. And um, we need to use the analog of the Mobius function to sift out k-free elements. So again, this is uh, what is going on here is uh, we're using the, um, the analogy between classical number theory and function fields to transport uh, some techniques. Uh, and it turns out that sometimes some of these techniques transport neatly and sometimes they don't. Uh, in this case, uh, most of it transports neatly. Um, sifting and sieving in this process in the function field case is uh, not too hard. And uh, you, you have uh, analogous functions and sometimes there are actually no error terms. So here's a notation that we used in order to set up our thing. So you, I told you already, this capital A is FQ of T. A plus is a set of all monic polynomials and P plus is a set of all monic irreducible polynomials in A. And then we uh, have the definition of the classical analog of the classical Mobius function. Mu of Q is just going to be uh, minus one to the R where R is the number of distinct prime factors when Q is a square free polynomial and it's zero otherwise. And we define a new function mu sub k of q, which is going to be one if q is k free and zero otherwise. And then you can write down uh, a formula for mu k of q in terms of the, the Mobius function. So this, this Mobius function should not be confused with the classical Mobius function. Here we're talking about this Mobius function here. Uh, we just use the same notation. <clears throat> so we can now set up the counting process. Um, the general setup is that uh, if you have, um, you want to count you want to count the number of irreducible polynomials that p plus m is, is k free. So this is what you would want to count. And then you rewrite your mu k in terms of the Mobius function I defined on the previous slide in this fashion. And then you split this sum. So here, degree of a, uh, a to the k b. Uh, keep in mind that the degree of p is growing. m is fixed, p is grow growing. Therefore, um, if you take the kth power of a particular polynomial and multiply it by b, then you can see that the degree of A has to be, uh, if the degree of P is B, D, you, you will see immediately the degree of A has to be bounded by D over K. So you can write this, rearrange the sum in this fashion. And now the inside sum, you're counting the number of irreducible polynomials of degree D, such that P plus M is A to the KB, and A is now fixed outside. And the beautiful thing is that inside, you can use Kornblum's theorem. So you're counting primes in a certain arithmetic progression mod a to the k. So we, but before we do that, this is what, uh, this is what Wei Chen Yao actually did, but um, his mistake was um, he tried to analyze the whole thing at one go uh, without uh, um, being careful about errors. Uh, in one place, the error calculation turns out to be wrong, but the strategy that he had is, is sound. And um, so anyway, we, we do that very carefully. We have to break it up a little, little bit more carefully than he did, and then, and, but it ends up uh, working. So for any T, uh, you can decompose this sum into two pieces, uh, T less than or equal D, D over K, and T, um, and, and so the degree of A is less than T, and the degree of A is bigger than T. That's basically that's what I'm saying here. And then once having done that in the, in the first part, you have to apply Kornblum's theorem. So Kornblum's theorem, um, as I mentioned earlier in an earlier slide, it's Q the D over D with a one over five Q, but there's an error term and the error term is bounded in this fashion. <clears throat> and notice that this is a minus sign here and this is a plus sign. So it's basically bounded by this stuff. And so you can put that in and then calculate the error. And then you have to worry about the second term. So the estimates uh, come out rather neatly. Um, I'm gonna skip uh, all the um, details. You understand the strategy. So you end up getting a main term 
and a particular error term. So this is the case when the degree of A is less than or equal to T. And uh, notice that the main term is of size Q to the D. So this is Q to the D. So you plug that. This is the main term from each of the in, inner parts. You shove it in. And so you, when, you, when you do that, you end up getting um, the following. For the error, for the second term, we have to analyze the second term. Second term, you have, um, you now, you apply actually a trivial estimate. So you just ask, put absolute values on mu of A and apply a trivial estimate, you end up getting D to the K minus degree of A, and then lo and behold, get, you get that. So now one needs to analyze the tails uh, and these tails are tails of actually, um, uh, sorry, this, this, is a, this is a convergent series, but keep in mind, that this is a summation over A, so the degree of A is bigger than T, so the tail of a convergent series, and when you an analyze that very carefully, you end up getting, this kind of stuff was not done in um, Wei Chen Yao's paper. So finally, we end up getting the main uh, error term is, is in this fashion, and the main term is of, uh, is of, is of this shape. And uh, once you uh, analyze the multiplicativity, uh, exploit the multiplicativity of these terms, you would like to, it's a, it's a finite sum, but now you'd like, to, um, you'd like to analyze this main term. And you'd like to take it all the way to infinity so that you can write down this thing as an Euler product, but then you have to calculate the tail again. And that's not hard to do. The main term is easily analyzed. You, you extend it to infinity and you can write it as an Euler product, which we do. And then um, you, you have to calculate the tail and the tail turns out to be um, easily calculable. And the error term is of the same size as before. And this completes more or less the proof of the theorem. So that's basically um, the idea behind uh, these two theorems. So, these, so as I've tried to mention, the the, uh, the 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 worlds of number fields, function fields, and Riemann surfaces. Um, the analogies that exist between them can be exploited, uh, and one could now take problems which are existing in the number field world and ask what what about the function field world. You can also go backwards and ask what about problems in the number field world, given a, given a result in the function field world and use this as a theme and program for research and also to expand your understanding. So thank you very much for your attention um, and happy 60th birthday round and many, many more happy returns. And once I'm back in India, I want, you, I want to treat you at my tea shop. Okay, so there we go. <laughs> Now that was not Photoshop. There is an actual tea shop there that was like that. No, because the spelling is suspicious. That's what. Uh, no, the spelling, spelling is. <laughs> no, I know they usually put an H. They usually put an H, but this is, yes, this yeah, is somebody yeah, has what... <laughs> some tea shop owner has the same name as I do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so that's our next order of business. Find out where this thing is. <laughs> but you know where you took the picture, right? You might have taken the picture. Oh. It was in Chennai. Or? No, I didn't take the picture. I just, I, I didn't take the picture. I actually found it. On, no, I found it on, yeah, it's, it's in Chennai, but I found it on Google. Oh. So should I stop sharing? Is that? You said the quasi Riemann hypothesis Davenport's result about quasi Riemann hypothesis implying the primitive root conjecture. So, similar kind of implication you would expect also in the case of uh, number field or in the general case of integers. Well, in the number field case, in, in the number field case, the art and primitive root conjecture was solved by wholly assuming the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, there's a considerable amount of work of myself and uh, yes. others um, in, in this context and uh, where we showed that one of 
you know, a finite set of numbers is yes. many primes, right? We showed that, yes. yeah. Yes. So, so uh, now well, your question is, is it possible? I'm getting some feedback. Is there a problem with the... Uh, uh, can uh, sorry, you it could be it could be for me because both me and Purushottam are here. It could be that you. No, we can hear properly. Okay. Anyway, so 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 now it seems to be okay. Um, so the what I, I think if I understand your question, this is what you're asking. You're asking now that we know the art and primitive root conjecture in the function field case in a very simple sort of way. Is it possible to transport some of these ideas back into the classical case and get something new? That's your oh, question, right? And no, I, I do not expect to get a better result by these techniques in the number, uh, I mean, in the case of integers, but I was hoping that uh, is it the result of Davenport? Corresponding results are already known. I mean, Huli's result is by using Riemann hypothesis, generalized Riemann hypothesis, but corresponding to Davenport, is there a result? No, That's a good question. So, yeah, I know, I know. So, I, I'm trying to rephrase Not your it. result. Your result is much stronger. I, I, yeah, so your question is basically, is there something known about Artin's primitive root conjecture assuming just a quasi-Riemann hypothesis? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a um, very good question. Um, uh, and and I believe, um, yeah, I believe that I had, uh, I think one of Balu's students, Amora, uh, she, okay. had, uh, I gave that kind of thing as a problem. And uh, so you could prove that if there are no zeros to the uh, right of some number, I forgot what it was, but some, okay. Uh, then you can actually get uh, Artin's con conjecture. But what is interesting is, your question is, in, will any quasi-Riemann hypothesis do, or do you need some number there? And uh, at the moment, the state of knowledge seems to be you need some number there, but I am convinced, good research problem, I'm convinced that a quasi-Riemann hypothesis will do. If you only want to prove infinitely, Yes, yes. Not forget asymptotic yeah, formulas. No. If you want to prove there are infinitely many uh, primes, I, I suspect that um, uh, a quasi Riemann hypothesis would, would be sufficient. And in your proof, you make this finiteness avoid Riemann, avoiding Riemann hypothesis. The techniques are to avoid Riemann, generalized Riemann hypothesis. Yeah. But yeah. can that be now modified if you know quasi Riemann hypothesis can give you? Can it be, means can you make it finer? Does it? Is it a possibility? Uh, that's a that's a good question. So the way we avoid uh, the Riemann hypothesis is by using sieve theory. Yeah. Uh, so your question then is: Is it possible to marry sieve theory somehow into some sort of quasi and yeah. get better results? And I and I I would I you know um, I, I sounds good. Sounds like a good plan to me. Okay, <laughs> so, sorry. I just okay. I'll leave it. <laughs> sounds like a good plan and I have a suspicion it's probably true you see the the um, so coming back to your other question uh, whether or not the methodology that was used by us now that we have a very you know super simple proof of the art and conjecture in the function field case uh, the two punchlines there are a simple asymptotic sieve and the um, reciprocity model so the question then becomes, is it possible to somehow inject the higher reciprocity laws into the art and primitive root conjecture? As far as I know, no one's been able to do that. Uh, and that is a that has been a sublim subliminal thought in my life. <laughs> I haven't figured out exactly, exactly how the, uh, you know, um, my suspicion is that somehow, you know, the Stickelberger theorem about the yeah, factoring yeah. of the Gauss sums and uh, the higher reciprocity loss can probably be used. Uh, and, if, and it is probably worth one's while. I see a lot of youngsters in this uh, room, in this virtual room. So I suspect that uh, you, if, you pay, if you study that, I mean, it's worth studying just for pure beauty. Uh, study the higher reciprocity laws um, and uh, see what, uh, try to understand it. Forget trying to prove any theorem, just try to understand it. And I suspect that something should come out. Thank you. Yeah. Did I end early, Purushottam? It's a bit, yeah. Okay, okay. Was it a 45-minute talk? Yes, it was. 
Okay, good. Oh, I'm on time. Okay. Ram, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Are there, are there Hello, Rajan. Uh, yeah, hi, Rajan. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Are there analogs of uh, uh, the Goldberg conjecture or the twin prime kind of conjecture? You know, that you fix a, uh, a polynomial or some such thing and uh, you know, look at yeah. the polynomial, uh, 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 right? Are there analogs yeah. of that? In, uh, yeah, there are. Uh, there are. Yeah, yeah now this is to be true. Yeah. So this is, this is a good question. This is really a good question. And this is where I think uh, I have, you know, people like myself. Uh, I'm getting feedback again. I don't know. Um, Rajan, do you want to try? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I suspect uh, that, um, you know, if we, this is where somehow you have to kind of um, discard your, you know, classical number theory perspective and just dive in. It turns out that uh, these questions, as you ask very nicely, uh, were investigated by Hayes and Effinger, Effinger and Hayes in a book which I have a PDF copy of, but can't say I've read. You see, the, 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 the curse of modern technology is I have PDF copies of lots of books I haven't read. Uh, so this is one of them. <laughs> and um, I sus interestingly enough, there are problems that are unforeseen that show up. Um, and uh, though it's uh, on, uh, on first glance, uh, it looks as if, there, there is, it should be doable, like the Goldbach conjecture or the twin prime. These are actually being looked at. Um, and um, I can't say I'm the super expert on this. Maybe somebody here is an expert, um, but it seems to me the analogs go through. And I, if I'm not mistaken, for example, the Goldbach conjecture is still unsolved in the function field case. I have to check that, but that's what I got the impression from Heffinger and Hayes. So maybe somebody in the in the room knows more about the status in the function field case, but I think it's not so simple and there are new problems emerge. New problems seem to emerge, which are surprises, uh, especially from an algebraic geometric perspective. Wow, well, okay. Mm. Also, this uh, what that problem of Hardy or somebody, uh, this n squared plus one. There are uh, is that uh, what infinitely many primes of the form n squared plus one? No, what is that? Yeah, is that, that's that's a, that's a problem. I'm not sure if it's Hardy and Littlewood, but that uh, sounds it sounds right to me. Uh, yeah. Sounds like uh, you know polynomial values, polynomials assuming primes infinitely often sounds like a hardy little bit conjecture to me. Yeah, And yeah, I believe yeah. they, they made that conjecture using the circle method as the model and then they made, so then the question is, as you correctly ask, what is the function field version of that and is that known? And, um, you know, um, I have to confess, uh, I didn't do my homework. Um, I don't know the status of all those things. Uh, but uh, fortunately, there are lots of youngsters in this uh, place. Uh, this is something that you could just sit down with a notebook, you know, one of these famous Ramanujan style notebooks. You sit down, go to the library, find out what's <laughs> known. <laughs> Ram, you look eager than the rest of us, and you sit down more empty than us. <laughs> I'm sure you would do it before us. <laughs> you don't know already the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I see, I see Biplob, I see Rashi, you know, I see Jotsna, I see all these people. So I, I'm, I'm addressing my comments to them. I <laughs> see Oh, well, there's a good book I can recommend. Uh, there's a good book I can recommend, Arithmetic of Function Fields by Michael Rosen. Oh, okay. And it's a beautiful book. It's a book that all the youngsters can read. Uh, the, the, the only problem is that uh, he reproduces Bill Hartz's complicated proof in, in, uh, of the art and primitive root conjecture in function fields. Uh, so I'm sure that if he had our proof, he would have shoved it in and you would have had a better treatment of it. So I, I consider our work to be now um, textbook material, so it should it should get into some book like this. <laughs> I don't think. 
Could, could I just make a comment on uh, the question that uh, Rajan and others were asking? Uh, yeah. So besides um, the functional field case in these more subtler questions, you know, there, there are new uh, aspects that don't, that don't appear in the number field case. And one of them, as Ram has already mentioned, it is uh, that the Mobius function, which is key to doing any kind of sieving, turns out to be a character. And that, that is called a critical. It's been exploited in several recent uh, papers. Yeah. So there's, you've got an extra tool that you don't have in the number field. It's not, not, not Riemann hypothesis, it's something different. Yeah. And uh, um, so, that, uh, maybe, yeah, so that, could be, that could be crucial in these kind of subtler problems of distribution and, and analog, analogs of problems on distributions of primes or sequences with prime certain divisibility properties. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you're you're right. You know, there's this uh, Rajan. I think you know, for example, the uh, famous conjecture of Chawla. You know, Chawla with the Mobius function. He he was, uh, and it goes back to the Sarnax Mobius randomness business. Um, so the idea is that the shifts of the values of the Mobius function should be independent. So uh, the uh, beautiful question of Chawla was, you know, the prime number theorem is, is equivalent to the fact that summation mu of n is little o of x. Summation n less than x mu of n is little o. And then he asked, well, let's generalize the, uh, the prime number theorem by saying mu of n, mu of n plus one, mu of n plus two, mu of n plus three, dot, 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 mu of n plus k, let's say, shifts. And can you show that these sums are also small? And we don't know the answer to that. But in the function field case, in the function field analog of that has been solved by a bunch of people. Uh, the name Schusterman seems to come into my head, uh, but there I think there are other authors in that paper, but that's the name that seems to come into my head. Um, and uh, it, the, it's been proved. This, this conjecture has been proved now in the function field case. And the reason for that is exactly what Kumar is saying. The Mobius function turns out to be a character. You know, it's actually it's, it's it's actually elementary to prove that Mobius function is a character. I mean, I gave a, I, I think I gave a mini course in ICER, where was that? ICER, I, IIT Gandhinagar, I think, uh, must have been, I think. Uh, I gave a mini course on this function field stuff. And I think I did mention this, um, that the Mobius function turns out to be a character in the function field case. And so when you're talking about averages, and you now you can see, you see, when you talk about uh, mu, if mu of n is a character, the Chawla problem becomes uh, a, a kind of like an Andre Vey type estimate because it's a character sum of a polynomial. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, right, right, you, get, right. you get the idea? I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, once it's a character, you, have, you are already talking about the character sums, chi of f. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, the other thing that I have to mention is V2. You see, V2. Uh, is essential in all of this stuff. Okay. You know? Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. And it, it, by the way, the I construction of the Hasse Weil zeta function, the construction of the Hasse Weil zeta function, is motivated by algebraic topology. You see the the, the, the and and what I find oh, fascinating is you have an elliptic curve and you have an elliptic surface and somehow all these APs when you average them over a surface, it's still, it, there's a, it's a remarkable cancellation. So this idea of Vey Lang, you know, fibering varieties and getting estimates is no good in the sense that it falls short of the optimal error term. And so you really need to interpret this as a zeta function of a surface and then use Vey two, that the Riemann hypothesis is known to say that there's lots of cancellation. Mm -hmm. oh, beautiful stuff. There's all, and I think that's a, that's the punchline in the Schusterman and others paper. Oh, okay, very interesting. In, when did in, this in, appear? Long back or maybe a year a year ago? A year ago? Oh, or two okay. Years. okay, okay, okay. I mean, I was carrying. Ram, the uh, other one is seven. Seven. Oh, seven. seven, seven. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Srinu, uh, yeah. yeah, thank you, Srini. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Schusterman and Savin. That's right. Okay. There may be other authors. I, I kind of vaguely remember them. But you see, this is the problem. The curse of the modern technology is you accumulate lots of papers that you have to read and end up reading nothing. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so this is, why, this is why we need many lives. See, you keep doing something that is better than. <laughs> Reading. <laughs> I don't know. Can I ask you a question? May I ask? Go ahead. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can yeah. hear you. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Professor Ram, this is, Professor Ram, this is Ramesh. Um, Hi, Ramesh. Um, yeah, hi. I just have a very general question that, you know, is there any study in the past on um, on primitive root being prime, on prime primitive roots? Or is there are there any instances where you have seen any interesting application of uh, prime primitive roots? In, you mean in the classical context? Yeah, in the classical context, yes. Well, I think it's an interesting question, and uh, I don't see any, any, how the problem becomes any easier by imposing the, the thing is prime, although I don't want to say that outright because um, in a sense, um, the, 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 in the function field case, uh, you know, I was looking at A of X being a primitive root, right? I mean, that's, that's, so A of X was a polynomial. In the function field case, uh, the factors of A of X show up and mm -hmm do have a role to play. So that's, uh, that's an interesting question you asked. Uh, in the function field case, the number of prime factors of A of X does matter. But in the number field case, as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem to matter. As far as I can tell. But, but it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. Uh, it's, it, it goes back to this business of uh, trying to figure out how to, in, how to use Stickelberger's theorem and then the art and primitive root conjecture again. Okay. Does okay. that help? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. I thought somebody else had a question. Shaoli, did you have a question? Yes, sir, may I ask? Yeah, sure. Probably. Yes, sir, you said that Mobius function can be viewed as a character. So, mm -hmm. so which type of character it could be and what will be the conductor? Something like that. It's a, it's a, it turns out to be it's a quadratic character. I mean, it's, it's actually elementary to prove this. I forgot who proved it, but it goes back to the 19th century. Um, I mean, if you, if you reinterpret it correctly, it goes back to the 19th century. Um, and I think I may even have it in my notes in the IIT Gandhinagar lectures. Okay, so I will see. Yeah, it's, it's an elementary. It's, were you there for that course? Uh, no, sir, I was not there. Mm -hmm. Your voice sounds familiar to me. Yes, sir. I'm sort of. So oh, okay. I'm... Yeah. Oh, hi. Hi. Yeah. I studied PhD from TI for Mumbai under some. Oh, yeah. I remember. I remember that. That's right. I remember that. And I think you helped me get to the airport one time. Too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody else have any questions? No, let's thank uh, both the speakers of the final session.